Um, I know that this is almost the end of common hours, but I'd like to invite the speakers to the podium and uh, give you an opportunity to ask some questions. I have many, but I know you guys might need to leave, so I'll give the forum to you first. There are a couple of people with microphones, so if you'd like to ask your question, please raise your hand. It could be addressed to anyone in, of the speakers. Shall I start with my question first? Oh, you have, well, we have some there. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, my first question is for uh, Raisa. I hope I'm saying your name correct. Um, I've I'm aware of a, a large financial services client that wanted to test their malware within their organization, their ability to deal with specific malware situations. And the company said, no way. And um, they um, ended up going outside to Amazon to do all of their malware testing. And I was just very curious. You know, this large organization wouldn't let this malware be tested on their own infrastructure. But Amazon's got these companies out there testing malware um, within their infrastructure. And, you know, we're talking about leakage and the side stuff that you guys talked about. Ha are we all at risk with all these, you know, companies testing their malware uh, problems out on AWS? Yes. Okay. Um, well, oh, th that's actually the first time I hear about the uh, type of usage of uh, cloud resources. So they're, they are used for all kinds of things. But uh, um, so, I mean, Basically, it all depends. Um, uh, supposedly, Amazon has good, um, uh, a good way to isolate those uh, virtual machines in which they are testing those, that, that, that malware. So um, um, it potentially, if that's not the case, it potentially could um, um, affect other customers using Amazon's uh, platform. Um, uh, there are also in their network, internal network in the data center, they have all kinds of uh, limitations as far as um, uh, you know what what you can do between the the, the various um, instances running there. You know, it's not like uh, they have all kinds of protections. Um, so you know, it's anybody's guess what, what can happen. I haven't heard of uh, things uh, uh, running out of control yet. Thank you. Uh, if anyone else wants to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let, let's go to the second questions. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Uh, I should have a two-part question or two questions. Uh, first is, um, I know that cloud computing offers uh, enormous opportunities for enterprises. But what do you feel, based on your experience and your research, um, are the advantages of um, cloud computing for technical communicators, specifically? And two, do you feel as though, or how do you feel cloud computing is um, sort of driving the market or driving um, publishing or you know, away from print media? So um, around applicability, I think there's broad applicability across a variety of market segments um, in the technical community. Um, you know, you think about massive amounts of data, like from the CERN Large Hadron Collider. Um, the challenge actually becomes uh, how do you get the data to where the computation needs to be done? So uh, there's a theory out there about uh, data gravity, with the point being that you know, it's like Newton's laws. Um, it's very hard to move very large objects. They have a lot of inertia. But what you're finding is that a lot of those large data sets are actually moving to the cloud and being hosted by cloud providers. And once they're there, the idea is that an application ecosystem will grow up for processing, analyzing, doing business intelligence, et cetera, around the data. So for the technical community, there are lots of examples of complex types of analyses simply based on the computational power of the cloud, there are some other really interesting cases where it's not just the computational power of the cloud,
but the cloud acting as a mediation mechanism for lots of users. A good example being uh, the Foldit game where different users were playing around with protein folding, which computers still don't do as well as humans. Um, so the ability to visualize the way that these protein molecules could fit together um, actually led to um, the discovery of the structure of the, it's like the, you know, uh, monkey uh, something or other virus, uh, which hadn't been solved by teams of biologists working for years. So, you know, you can go all, all over the place. You can look at uh, seismic analysis for oil fields. You can look at, you know, physics simulations at uh, protein folding and molecular dynamics. So the sky's the limit as far as the applicability for the uh, technology segment using the cloud. And the second question, I missed the last part of it. So I'll, if someone else heard it, then they can answer. <laughs> Should I repeat? I think it was about uh, how can cloud help, what, what, what is the importance of cloud in, for publishing, in moving away from print? I think that was the question. Um, yeah, I, I so, can I repeat mean, it. You know, there's lots of case studies there um, that are interesting. The famous one being the New York Times Times Machine, um, where what they did is they took 100 years of microfiche um, New York Times and it was unsearchable because it was just sitting on microfiche. So if you wanted to try and find something, you could kind of, I guess, spool through all of the billions of roles. And so what they did is they asked for a quote from the IT department, and the quote was basically, we can do that for you. It'll take about a year and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they said, nah, I'll just do it on Amazon. And for $150 um, and 24 hours, they had completely scanned it in you know, did all the OCR, so there's now the searchable archive at the Times Machine. But, you know, I think we're all aware of, um, you know, both those types of studies. Another good example is Hillary Clinton's private papers where um, they were released and it was, you know, 20,000 random letters, emails, whatever, um, and so they were able to process it and index it very rapidly. So I think, you know, what you're finding, obviously, is lots of different paradigm shifts First of all, you know, it's from newspapers to content delivery devices like this. Secondly, it's a fundamental shift in the notion of forgetting about the technology, a broadcast mechanism that says, I have a reporter in a newspaper and once a day I publish this thing and it goes out to everyone to more of a web 2.0 interactive style capability where you have, you know, first of all, the democratization of publishing, so you've got you know, more and more people, everyone's a writer. Like, I mean, I'm a writer, I'm a blogger. Who, who, the, who am I? I didn't go to journalism school. And conversely, anyone who comments on a blog post is also a de facto writer. And uh, you get lots of weird system dynamics effects, as you know, where things go viral. And then the other thing that you're seeing, obviously, is the move away from just text into rich multimedia, whether it's video, flash, HTML5, so, you know, the notion of actually reading words on paper is, you know, as antiquated now, you could argue, as, you know, uh, papyrus scrolls with quill pens and, you know, ink made out of berries. So, you know, even you're starting to see some really interesting hybrids where even the New York Times on the iPad, it isn't just the New York Times on the iPad. They didn't just take the physical paper take a photo of it and then show it to you as a JPEG, right? You now have, you know, video, hyperlinking, all of the things that the new technology and new media really enable. Thank you. Uh, out of curiosity, how many here use e-books? How many do, do still own physical books? Okay, so that's... Uh, a 50-50 still there, but uh, absolutely, there is a big shift. Um, any other questions? Yes here in the front. Okay, I have two questions, one directed towards Joe and the other towards Gilbert. Um, the first one being, you mentioned how uh, customer relationships are very important for cloud computing, sort of how Netflix can pick certain movies that you yourself wouldn't know you would enjoy. Do you think it's worth it for businesses to attempt to do this and get it wrong versus not do it at all? Because like I've had some pretty bad movies on Netflix that I thought I would like. And for Gilbert, the second question, 
is what's stopping, instead of like going to Amazon for server space, what's stopping you from teaming up with other TV show websites that say your TV show starts on Mondays, but their peak is on Wednesdays? What's stopping with you two going and getting your own server center, pooling your resources together for two server spaces, uh, for one server that you guys both use at different times? So uh, I'll handle the first question and a little bit of the second question, if I could. Um, so the uh, answer to the first question is, you know, obviously um, these days companies get a lot of things right and they get a lot of things wrong, right? So there's, you know, I won't mention particular social networks that have recently IPO'd, but, you know, there have been some issues around uh, privacy with them, right? Um, and, you know, everyone's kind of trying to figure out their way through this as far as what the correct strategy is. That said, um, the notion of understanding your customer better, I think, is critically important from multiple perspectives. First of all, back to that model of operational excellence versus product leadership versus customer intimacy. If you're Netflix and you're competing with you know, any other video streaming service, right, which there's more and more out there these days, um, what exactly is your angle? you could lower price, but companies don't like to do that because that's then just a race to the bottom. You could try and be more operationally excellent, um, you know, but that's difficult to maintain a sustainable competitive advantage because you know, they're leveraging companies like Amazon um, and content delivery networks to be able to distribute their content. You know, most of them uh, seem to have done better as straight intermediaries where they're not trying to create content. Obviously, you've got Red Label and, you know, various companies trying to also produce content. But then you're going astray from your core business, which is offering a very broad catalog. So what are you left with if not customer intimacy as a strategy when you're in that kind of, you know, delivery business? Um, you know, there's some product leadership for a while, like, you know, Netflix, you could get streamed movies, whereas otherwise you'd have to drive to the DVD store, right, or, you know, or get them by mail and wait two days even though you wanted to watch it right now. So as that retains parity, there's really nothing left but customer intimacy. And the great thing about that is it's great for the customer because excluding the movies, obviously it was your taste that was the issue, not their algorithm. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so, uh, but the better that they can get that, right, it, there's several things. First of all, um, you know, they maintain information about you, which in turn, that's sticky, right? They don't let you export that to a different provider, so you'd have to re-enter all that information around preferences, which is a little bit of an issue, and it's just not worth the hassle just because they sent you one movie you don't like. Um, moreover, you continue to stay with a service which reduces churn and customer acquisition costs, right? Um, and then the third thing is maybe not so much with Netflix because of their model, but if you take Amazon, there's the opportunities inherent in upsell, right? You know, because you read this, you also might like that. And you don't always order everything that they recommend, but every once in a while it's like, hey, that looks pretty cool. Sure, I'll buy that. And then that's you know, 30, 50, whatever dollars out of your pocket and into their coffers. So, you know, it's effective as a business strategy in terms of both revenue growth and customer lifetime value as well as uh, cost reduction. Um, around, to, to finish my point, I'll just say a little bit about the uh, answer to the second question. Uh, I showed that chart about the one over square root of any effect around uh, penalty functions associated with statistical multiplexing of workloads. There's this whole debate in the industry about private cloud versus public cloud, and if it's a private cloud on your own resources, is it really a cloud? And I sort of agree with some of that, um, which is why I think, and the angle I take in the book is really, let's just look at the economics. So who cares where it's coming from, just are there economics? And if the workloads are independent, right, and therefore likely uncorrelated. You could have something that's independent also happens to be correlated for a moment by sheer dumb luck, but assuming they're also uncorrelated, you then get these stat muxing benefits. And if the relative penalty function is one over the square root of n, then what that says is if n is two, 
that's 1 over 0 0.707, which is a 30 percent reduction in relative penalty. So if you were nothing more than like RJR Nabisco, right, where you, you know, back when they were around, I think they're divested, but you're running a tobacco business and a chocolate chip cookie business, there's probably not that much correlation, you know, gee, I just had a cigarette, I think I feel like a chocolate chip cookie right now. Um, so that gives you enough independence. If you're GE with 15 different divisions, you can do a lot of that multiplexing yourself and achieve relatively high utilization. And that's before you play other games like running deferrable workloads like test dev and the off hours. So you know, the basic answer is if you only have one thing that you're trying to solve, it's a little bit of a challenge. You've got to build a peak with the padding or overhead, as you mentioned. But to the extent that you can multiplex anything, whether you're an internal service provider, like the IT shop serving multiple business units, or better yet, if you're a mid-sized or even better large cloud provider, then you can get that, you know, this world of beauty, which is um, the, all of the uh, equations converge in the limit to 100% utilization and uh, you know, only as much capacity as you need at the mean.